This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 922, recorded on Wednesday, April 19th, 2023. Fossilized science! Hi everyone, I'm Blair Bazdrich. Today we're going to fill your head with bats, electricity, and carbon footprints. But first... Thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twist. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following program is a glimpse into the world of science. A world that is all around us, inside and out, across every life form, every interaction of chemistry, and every force of nature. From the beginning of time to the cold, dark, meaningless end of the universe. From complex systems to simple solutions, from a child's questioning mind to a lifetime of researchers' lifetimes in pursuit of answers. And always, no matter how much we have learned, we find there is still much more to know. The world of science is a big world, spanning every known subject and leading us ever into subjects unknown. The world of science is a deeply fascinating place. In every direction, mystery and adventure await. The hardest part is choosing where to start, which is why each week we offer a few suggestions here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries. science to you Blair <laughs> good science to you Justin and everyone listening out there welcome to this week's episode of this week in science thank you all for joining us we have a great show ahead on this show we have tons of science news we are missing Kiki she is at a conference this week but we'll try to make up for her absence with uh we never could but we'll try to bring some extra science on our end this week so it doesn't feel too light. I brought stories about plastic pollution, electricity, big animals, bat skeletons, and fossils. What did you bring, Justin? I have got some interesting PFAS news. Uh, concrete news. I always like to give a, a an update in the world of what's going on in concrete. <laughs> uh, I haven't. Ex there's a study. There's a study I covered. Uh, I'm going to cover here, which is it's a, just sort of an interesting study on one level, but it might have an ethical question to it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to put it out there and, and see what what everybody thinks. And uh, an amazing discovery. On the way to catch a train in Paris. Okay. Very interesting segment this week. Um, as we jump into the show here, I want to remind you all that you should subscribe to Twist, either on YouTube, if you're watching us, or if you're listening, you can subscribe through your platform for podcasts of choice. Also Facebook. Basically, just anywhere we exist, if you can tell the analytics that you like us, that would be great. <laughs> you can help support us that way. So that's why. Right. So that's also why the, the, the everybody's always saying hit the like buttons or the subscribe buttons or whatever. It's because the more that people do that, the more people who aren't them, yeah, uh, potentially we'll can find get out to about see us. It. Yeah, mm. exactly. Then we can tell more people about all this cool science. Of course, you can also go to twist.org to find out more about us or share yeah. it to a friend. Awesome. So, Justin, tell me. Your first story. What do you have? All right. Uh, this is where I'm going to mess everything up and, and switch it up real quick. Okay. So, I was a little worried. I wasn't going to go off the run sheet this week. So I'm going to start with the concrete news. Because it's actually, the, I think, okay. the, 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 the it could be a good news segment. We'll see. I'll be the judge of that. Go ahead. <laughs> Just good news. Concrete edition. This is a 
carbon negative concrete formula has been developed by engineers at Washington State University. The proof of concept formula that they've uh, got so far is nearly as strong as regular concrete. So it makes it sound like it's not good enough, but it's it's comparable <laughs> strength wise. Uh, what the, the the researchers infused regular cement with an environment an environmentally friendly biochar. So this is a type of charcoal that is made up from organic waste. And they have, there have been attempts to add this to concrete in the past as a method of sequestering uh, carbon. But in the past, researchers have gotten about a 3% admixture before the concrete was no longer binding correctly. So they have a, some sort of a, a a part of their what they've developed was a sh beforehand strengthening of the biochar itself using and I thought this was clever concrete wastewater. And this is wastewater that's got a lot of calcium in it and and alkaline stuff, but it's it's sort of the leftover part of the process of making concrete normally. They used this in a method to harden the biochar and then mixed it in. And they got 23% admixture, which is huge. What's interesting about this is that then once this concrete, as this concrete hardens, actually, they got more than that. They got 30%. I'm sorry, 30% biochar. As the cement hardens, it can suck up from the surrounding environment, from the air, up to 23% of its weight in carbon dioxide as it's, as it's reaching its, uh, huh. its comparable to ordinary. So that's why it's carbon so, negative. Carbon, that's the carbon negative aspect of it, is that right. it's actually able to be a carbon sink <laughs> as it hardens. Wow. Okay. Cool, but it's not as strong. Well, you know, because like they didn't give me the tensile strengths or the whatever, <laughs> right? Like in right, the straight, right. yeah. They say in one part they say it's comparable, and then the other part, then the, there's also verbiage that says it's nearly as strong as. Right, 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 right. But you don't need all concrete to be the strongest concrete. Uh, you know, certainly if you're talking about something that is going to be used for patios or maybe even sidewalks, it doesn't have to be like infrastructure for a building concrete kind of a thing. The other thing is, this is just a proof of concept to see how much biochar they could get into this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of things like we've talked about in other <laughs> cement and concrete updates on the show where we can recreate some of what we've been learning from ancient Roman concrete, which lasts much, much, much longer. This is why the Colosseum still exists. This is right. why there's all these, we can see all this wonderful architecture from ancient Rome that's still standing because they had some pretty unique uh, cement uses, uh, formulations that we aren't using. And it but also we're also then, looking for the cheap, easy to make industrial right and part things, of the yeah. problem with that though then is the lifespan also is that is a problem or if you're in a capitalist society is that a good thing so in the beginning <laughs> talking about planned when, obsolescence right yeah in the beginning when you're building everything on a concrete yeah fantastic Wow, look, it's strong, it's cheap, it went up quick, and now everything's fine. And you'll be back in five years to pay us again. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the repair aspect of it uh, gets tough. The What is it? It's something like 100 or 150 years is like the top end of all the concrete that we've used. Uh, you know, that's, that sounds like, oh, well, I'll never have to, you know, change my driveway. But then, you know, but that time goes by, and then... Mm -hmm. That means that everything that's made out of concrete needs to get replaced in 100 years, which right. that's a lot of stuff. What is they threw in a statistic here, too, about how much concrete? What is it? Four billion. Oh, gosh. Four billion tons of concrete are poured, uh, produced every year globally. 
to have to, you know, so then you figure if we, if you start with that number, that's how much we, we're putting, we're building with it. 150 years from now, we, we need to be doing that still just to replace everything mm -hmm. we made today. All the bridges, all the buildings, all the sidewalks, all the everything. So their name, and this is currently this, this concrete production is somewhere around 8% of the the contribution to global warming. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. Yeah. But the, the, the question I have then is, if concrete is already breaking apart at a certain point, chemically, what is capturing the carbon? And when concrete fails, even if it's this concrete, does it release carbon? Right. Yeah. Well... <laughs> It's just something to consider because then if you have all of this new concrete and we use it a bunch and then a hundred years from now, it all starts to crumble. We'll have a giant carbon release. That wouldn't be good either. So just, I don't know. Yeah. I'm curious what the chemical property is and how it's sequestering the carbon. And, well, the, and there's also that. like, I, what is it? Concrete like naturally absorbs oxygen. Is it? It was some problem they had in the biosphere. They built a, the, the, you know, the, the biodome or whatever it was where they, they were like, oh, we're going to take these researchers and put them in this self-contained building that's cut off from the outside world. It's going to have its own water and its own oxygen plants and everything. It's going to be like a, a, be able to be self-sustaining. But the concrete, there was so much concrete that it sucked up a bunch of the oxygen. Oh. <laughs> so they were, everybody was starting to get a little lightheaded. <laughs> I had to go open a window, which was Biodome 2. Thank you. I had Yikes. to open a window, and that uh, okay. kind of ruins the experiment when you're doing that. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, speaking of unintended experiments, um, let me tell you about uh, ocean plastic. Um, it's, we know it's a problem. There's a lot of it. There are these things called gyres, which are giant like trash continents in the ocean not great to think about but um uh, a team of researchers led by smithsonian environmental research center CERC, and the university of hawaii at manoa um they found coastal species representing diverse taxonomic groups um in in the eastern north pacific subtropical gyre on over 70 percent of the plastic debris they examined okay the, so you have aquatic animals in the plastic why is that weird because they're coastal species and they were in the middle of the ocean on the plastic they carried more coastal species than open ocean species so the coastal species were hanging out on this plastic because it was like an artificial coast so this suggests that past biogeographical boundaries among marine ecosystems, which have been established for millions of years, are rapidly changing because of the floating plastic pollution accumulating in the subtropical gyre. So like, it's um, we had the, gosh, what was her name? We had this amazing biologist on the show talking about the Neustrom, which is uh, this kind of layer of biota on the open ocean. And that when you try to scrape plastic debris out of the ocean you can mess up the newsroom okay great this is a whole nother level and is this a good thing or a bad thing i don't know it's just <laughs> different it's just we've changed it so they yeah. analyzed 105 plastic samples these were collected by the ocean cleanup during 2018 and 2019 in the north pacific subtropical gyre um and so this was done by volunteers, non-governmental -gov organizations, all these different groups coming together to kind of try to remove some trash, which sounds like a good thing. And while they were at it, they said, hey, let's do some science on that trash. So they checked it out and they found 37 different invertebrate species that are normally relegated to coastal waters. And that's over triple the number of species of open ocean types that they found in there. They were also reproducing and they found individuals of multiple life stages. So they were like thriving mm -hmm. on this plastic. Mm -hmm. So scientists have already known that, that organisms, including coastal species, of course, colonize marine plastic debris, like I was talking about, but until now they were unaware that they essentially have established <sighs> coastal communities 
in the open ocean on these gyres. So this is yeah, a new... It's just a, to them, it's just an island. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is a new human-caused impact on the ocean that we haven't really talked about yet, which documents the scale and potential consequences that that we haven't really considered. So is this a good thing? Are they endangered species? Or are, is it a bad thing? Is it Are we now bringing invasives to the open ocean that are impacting other invertebrate ecosystems? Yeah. TBD. <laughs> I'm guessing it's the second one. Um, but it's, <laughs> well, more research is needed. Basically, this is just like, whoa, there's entire coastal communities living on this plastic. We got to find out more. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the Newstrom is the reason we might not want to just scoop up the trash because we, we are sort of collecting uh, the normal organisms of the ocean onto these islands and, and on and around about them. But then if, it's, uh, if the majority of them are from coastal, then is it maybe the... Right. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so then is is this actually impacting the ecosystem in the new storm and where it's like, you don't even have the right junk in there, so just take it. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I it's, don't know either. Yeah, the, so there's the, more, yeah. Is, is, and so this is like, a, we've created this false biome, as we mm-hmm. do whenever humans mm-hmm. are having anything from uh, a... a uh, uh, trash midden, you know, for dump the city dump. I'm sure if people went out and just tested where where all our trash goes, we'd probably find that there's an interesting collection of uh, microorganisms that are gathering there that probably weren't naturally normally found there. Uh, the question is, does it, is it? I don't know if it would be something that would be you you want to protect, but then again, the at this point, we're not stopping using plastic or throwing it away. Right. Mm-hmm. So we're just adding to this this island that now we know has at least one <laughs> form of life that is adapted to it. Yeah. I yeah. don't know that the larger marine species are, are enjoying it as much, but there are, there are food networks that can derive mm-hmm. from this. Yeah. So that's really the question is, is what is the impact of these species? Is it now an invasive problem? Also, the thing that I can't help but think of is if they're reproducing and they have all the life stages represented on this plastic, at what point is the plastic impacting their growth? Because invertebrates also are very easily impacted by microplastics. So if they're in the up in the business as it were (laughs) they're like in it right is it is it impacting their biology in a way that that we should be studying is it a healthy community is it not a healthy community so it's it's more just that they they've made this aha moment that's oh my god there's a lot of coastal species on here we need to figure out more so yeah yeah Mm-hmm. The, the, my concern is like okay, so the microorganisms are fine, if if they are, right? You know, uh, yeah, are they? Th- then you have like the beginnings, the underpinnings of a food web. There, great. And then at what point up that food chain is something just is scarfing down more plastic than it can handle, and you know, so it's it may not be, it might be fine for the microorganisms even. But then somewhere in that food chain, it seems like plastic is just not an organic material. It's just not yeah. something you should be eat- anything should be eating. <sighs> yeah, not not delicious, not good. No. Uh, you know what else isn't delicious is PFAS. Yeah. <laughs> Tell so, us about we... PFAS. So this is a University of Rhode Island research uh, led study. And it's confirming a direct link between certain chemicals in drinking water and human obesity. Specifically, if there's increased PFAS content in blood, 
that uh, is accumulated from from the water. It promotes weight gain, and it makes it harder to keep a lower body weight after weight loss. So this is a quote from uh, Philippe Gargian, Gargian, MD, PhD, physician, who holds a uh, research professor appointment at University of Rhode Island. We previously shown that children with increased PFAS concentrations tend to gain, gain weight and develop higher levels of cholesterol in the blood. We now focus on adults who participate in an experimental study of five different diets in regard to weight gain. Our results add to the concern that environmental pollution may be affecting our metabolism so that we tend to gain weight. Now, there's all sorts of problems with PFAS. There's all sorts of problems with lots of things, though, in the world. And so <laughs> yeah. everything kind of goes and becomes this white noise of like, oh, you're not supposed to eat the organic food this week because there was a news report. And then, oh, but you can't eat the non-organic because of this study right, or whatever it is, right? Like so much. Which, however, I think one of the, the biggest strengths is people's sense of of wanting to lose weight, <laughs> right? And so, so maybe now people will start to take PFAS contamination seriously because they don't want to gain weight. I know that sounds like I'm oversimplifying all of humanity, but I, I'm probably not too wrong. But Justin, people still eat food that that make them gain weight. <laughs> yes, yes, they do. That's usually one of the. It's usually a, a main driver. Yeah. But, but just follow me on this. If global warming was going to make everybody gain 15 pounds, right? I think but you had people... to scrub your pan a little harder. I don't know. If, if, if global warming was, was going to make everybody uh, gain weight and, and break out in acne, uh, regardless of age, I have a feeling there's there'd be a little bit more visceral rejection of things that are carbon emitting, and and maybe something like this will will grab people's attention about PFAS. Now, because we've also been we've also been talking about there's been some recent innovations in figuring out ways of removing PFAS from water, and you know th these sorts of things that might get a government funding at some point or some grants, but. Yeah, eventually down the road after the researcher has struggled to push their research from one grant to the next kind of a thing. This might be the thing that gets public attention and, and uh, you know, and gets a, 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 a more governmental focused role. Because weight gain correlated to causes of death is the highest. Of all of the things that you can do that correlate to all causes of death, obesity is the top one. So, this might be something that would would I know I know health organizations are aware of PFAS and and there's reasons we're trying to remove it from everything. It's still, apparently, in rain gear, uh, in some in some products, there's products that are being made still with PFAS even though we understand it's a horrible, terrible thing that's everywhere on the planet. But anyway, yeah, weight gain I, is another thing you can add to the list. I, I think that's an oversimplification, and I think that PFAS yes. really messes with your body, and so they're pointing at one symptom and saying, oh, it makes you gain weight, but like, really it's ravaging your body in other ways, and that is just yeah. one result of what's happening right. right the metabolic system you're also talking about uh all forms of diabetes mm -hmm. you're talking about mm -hmm. uh you know there's there's a, a host of diseases liver uh, problems all these things are, this, your meta your metabolic system is involved in a lot of things beyond weight gain weight gain might even be a symptom of other things that are taking yes. place yep so yep but 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 hang on now. 
when communicating to the public, and not not this show's public. This show's public knows, you know, as much as I do, if not more, about anything. But the to to explain things to the general, larger mass of people out there who don't care about the details. Hey, did you hear? There's a chemical that makes you gain weight. Just to, and it gets into your drinking water, and you don't even know you're, you're taking it. Oh, that's really terrible. Let's stop that. Yeah, okay. Keep it simple. Eh, we'll see. Maybe. Um, Justin, I need Doctor Justin to sell something for me, real quick. Can yeah. you do an advert for electricity band aids? <laughs> What's the matter? Ah, I got this cut and it just won't heal. It looks like you're using a plastic bandage. Yeah, yeah, you know, the kind that everybody uses. Well, not everybody. Now there's something better. Electro bandage. There you go. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> uh, I am here to tell you about electro bandage. No, it's about <laughs> using electric stimulation to heal wounds. This is from Ooh. Chalmers University of Technology. And uh, they have done some preliminary research looking at electric stimulation as a method to speed up the healing process, making wounds heal up to three times faster. These are usually smaller superficial wounds, which we don't worry too much about. You know, I personally, I will slap on a Band-Aid for a few hours and then when it falls off, I just go eh, and then it kind of heals. But there are people who have very specific ailments that cause small wounds to be a big problem so people with diabetes spinal injuries poor blood cir circulation or any sort of impaired wound healing byproduct of various diseases mean that there is a greater risk of infection of chronic wounds that will not close and in the long run can lead to terrible consequences including actual amputation from those infections. So these small superficial wounds might not seem like a big deal to many of us, but to a specific group of people, they are a real health concern. And so if you could quickly close those wounds much faster than just letting your potentially immunocompromised body fight to close that wound itself, that could help reduce these kind of fears of infection or um or other kind of complications from having those wounds so what they did is they worked on an old hypothesis that electric stimulation of damaged skin could be used to heal wounds the idea behind it is that skin cells are electrotactic which means they're directionally they directionally migrate in electric fields so if an electric field is placed in a Petri dish with skin cells, the cells stop moving randomly and start moving in the same direction. They start to kind of dance in an orderly fashion. So they investigated how this principle can be used to electrically guide the cells in order to make wounds heal faster. They used a tiny engineered chip and they were able to compare wound healing in artificial skin. This wasn't real skin yet stimulating one wound with electricity and letting the other one heal without electricity. And as I mentioned, the one treated with electricity healed three times faster. Now, the next step for this group is they received a large grant, which will allow them now to continue their research, this time looking at actual skin cells. And they hope to be able to develop a wound healing product for consumers on the market. So there's your electro bandage right there. And so when they look at different actual skin cells and how they interact during stimulation, they can actually take a step closer to a realistic wound and be able to eventually they want to be able to scan the wounds before they enact the electro bandage so that they can have stimulation that is based on each individual wound kind of tailored to it so that it's extra effective. Yeah. I, well, I love how researchers think doctors have all this free time. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it, yes, if you are a person who's immunocompromised or has diabetes or has these other things that make you're still small not getting them to have access to a doctor that they're going to scan a wound and then create the customized. <laughs> no, that's just... What you're going to have to do, because nobody's going to wait for this 
to come well, out. Well, maybe it's a machine you buy at Walgreens, you know? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, they have, they do sell, uh, no, I'm not going to recommend, I'm now I'm recommending home versions of a treatment for a thing that just got invented. But I am going to use my TENS unit that I usually use for the <laughs> lower back pain. And if I get a cut, I'm just going to slap that on. Oh, boy. I don't know about that, of... Justin. No, that's not I don't think that's the same. No. Well, maybe this is why. You're supposed to be we... creating an electric <laughs> field where the wound is. <laughs> not not so the stimulating think... the muscles with electricity. No. Okay. No. <laughs> so anyway, point being, this is nowhere near market yet. They're not even using real skin cells yet. But yes, you could potentially have an electro ba- a smart electro band-aid at some point that could help you heal wounds. I think it's a pretty cool idea. Um, and with that, I think it's time for that time of the show. What time is it, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> is it time is for t- Blair's Animal Corner? Mm-hmm. With Blair? She loves our creatures, great and small. By pet, mill, a pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a good boy. What you got, Blair? I have. Oh, I have so much. Let's see. I brought some extra stuff this week. Um, So first, okay, my first story. Uh, What do you think moves faster? A elephant or a gazelle? Well, uh, gosh. So I I haven't, like, you know, had to run from (laughs) either one. But my, my immediate instinct is that the gazelle... Okay. is going to be the faster okay. uh, top speed. I know I know I'm probably wrong cuz the way you're saying it and an elephant's big and strong and they're fast so you can you see them run but right. That gazelle is yeah. just quick. How about like let's let's get closer. Let's get more oh. down and dirty with it. Do you think an elk or a white-tailed deer is faster? <laughs> I guess I'm going smaller again. I think I'm going. I'm going with the white-tailed deer again. Okay, but what about like a deer or a mouse? Okay, so here's <laughs> the thing. I'm gonna do then. Yeah. I'm because now now we're in such a scale difference. I'm gonna go with the mouse of speed compared to body length or something. Uh, no, just over- flat speed. We're just doing flat speed. Wait, 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 it's a mouse and a versus a, a what now? I don't know, a deer. <laughs> Something deer. bigger. Whatever. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm still going to go with the deer just because I think they're going to mm-hmm. cover more area. But okay. I think technically the mouse is faster. Okay. It's just about, the small legs. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more. How about like an eagle <laughs> and a sparrow? Let's what just do, do the rest faster? of the show like this. I think. <laughs> Uh, definitely a sparrow. Okay, interesting. All right, so the reason I am asking all these questions is that the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research and the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, Germany, looked at animal speed related to body size. Uh They developed a model to look at the relationship between animal size and traveling speed. They used data from 532 species. And I had to dig into the actual text here because I got very curious about what kind of species they were looking at. They used 699 estimates of mean or median travel speed taken from 170 studies across a pool of 532 species. And this is where I was surprised. From various taxonomic groups, amphibians, arthropods, cnidarians, birds, fishes, mammals, mollusks, reptiles, that spanned 15 orders of magnitude in body mass and five orders of magnitude in travel speed. So they looked, this wasn't just mammals. This wasn't just warm-blooded animals. This wasn't just quadrupeds. This was everybody. Help me out. Because my... uh... Yeah, mollusks is a whole group of uh, yeah. creatures. Mm-hmm. 
uh, none of which can I, would would I like if I got assigned. Oh, you're going to measure the top speed of a mollusk. Mm-hmm. I don't even know how the to get one to move. You're not. You're not. You're not comparing mollusks <laughs> to elephants. You're comparing small mollusks to large mollusks. Is what you're doing. Okay. 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 So, fair enough. So fair you're enough. looking at kind of similar groupings. Okay. But what they found is that larger animals actually travel more slowly than medium-sized animals. So small mm-hmm. animals travel the slowest, medium-sized animals faster, large animals slower again. They believed that just if you're looking at basic mechanics of the body, larger mm-hmm. animals should be able to travel faster because they have longer wings, they have longer legs, they have longer tails. But these medium-sized animals typically had the fastest sustained speeds. Why is that? The researchers attribute this to the fact that larger animals require more time to dissipate heat that their muscles produce while moving. And so they have to travel more slowly to avoid overheating. This is a surface ratio, uh, a surface area thing, basically, Hmm. is their is their suggestion. And so any animal's traveling speed could be explained by jointly considering how efficiently it uses energy and sheds heat. So this is how they kind of made this hypothesis. And then they were able to reverse engineer it and it worked. So they could guess a traveling speed based on size and their energy efficiency. Kind of proving this theory. Is it? (laughs) I don't buy it. I don't buy it at all. Based on their size, based on this math, I, I, there's lots of math happening. Sure, sure, but like I like uh, so I I'm in complete agreement with uh, like that was intuitively for me like the smaller or the medium medium size would be faster. Intuitively, that made sense. Okay, however, just because of surface area heat dissipation. Not buying it. I, I mean, the thing that I think but of, Justin, obviously, look, is look at all this math. <laughs> look at oh, it all. Well, you know, you put it that <laughs> way, and then I have no argument. Except, look at where it. is where is gravity? Where is mass? Uh, the ratio? Where is the the energy that goes up probably exponentially for a running elephant versus a running mouse? You know, like I don't think these. You know, it was one of the things that was disheartening to learn as a child. It was, uh, remember somebody was explaining to me that uh, King Kong could not exist. Because huh. if, uh, if there was a, a, an ape that big, it would crush its own uh, bones under its body weight. Unless over evolutionary time, it developed really, really thick bones. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, but the, but then, like, of the dinosaurs with very thick bones, they also don't tend to have those long legs and stand up yeah, right. Well, and quite like this. So never so, say but, never. <laughs> but this is like this is like, if it's left out gravity and energy and the like upper capabilities of what tissues can do without breaking under all of those pressures and things, and just say, ah, oh, surface area. I get that surface area would correlate to it. Because if you're bigger, right. you'll have more. Mm-hmm. It just seems like there's a lot more physics involved and yeah. and a lot more anatomy involved I mean, yeah. than <laughs> surface area. Yeah. That would that would track with absolutely, you know, because we don't have we don't have like lead based life form. That is the same, you know, two mice of the same size, but one is constituted of lead and is much heavier than the other. So obviously we're made of cells, which are going to have, you know. So you're right. So so this is a correlation, but it was such a effective correlation that they could map results. They could they could reverse map their results. So yeah. it's a very effective correlation. So you're right. The The question now is, is there causation? Or is there another characteristic that's related to this that can explain it, which is kind of what you're getting at. Um, yeah. So 
I don't know, but <laughs> here's here's how you see if physics know. is involved. Here's how you yes. see if physics is at all involved in this, and gravity is all at all part of this scenario. You take an elephant, a mouse, a mollusk, and a spider, and you drop them all from ten meters no. height, and and you see if there's any accumulated different effects on outcomes based on weight. Uh, Don't let be... Justin in any biological studies with animals, please. So the so in the end, these findings actually have significance okay. to conservation because lots of animals deal with something called habitat fragmentation, which is when you end up with human settlements, roads, barriers, walls buildings, malls, I don't know, in the way of a larger animal habitat. And so they are suddenly fragmented away from these other areas. So if you know, if you can anticipate the movement speed of an animal, you can also anticipate their needs in a habitat space and the potential impacts of habitat fragmentation from human development, from climate change, from all these different things that are going on. So they say this needs further investigation. So this is the next, this is the next correlation that they're looking at, right? Is so they've they've identified this one correlation, which is uh m- middle-sized animals are fastest, larger animals are slower than than the medium-sized animals. They can accurately chart that based on their energy efficiency and their size. Great. So if you can chart speed, can you chart the impacts of fragmentation? based on their movement speed. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. Because then you don't have to spend, you know, 20 years observing the animals to figure out what their their range is. And then by the time you're done studying it, it's too late. A bunch of the land is gone. So now you can actually, like, predict what they need. So, you know. Justin, you want to hear about some fossils? I have two different fossil stories. I love fossil stories. Great. I don't often have a lot of fossil stories in the animal corner, but I'm very excited. I have two this week. So the first one is about the oldest bat skeletons ever found. <sighs> They're, uh, this was found by the American Museum of Natural History. More on how they found it later. It's an interesting story. But they described a new species of bat based on the oldest skeletons ever recovered. This was in Wyoming about 52 million years ago, before, before it was called Wyoming. And this supports the idea that bats diversified rapidly on multiple continents at that time. So it's kind of, it pushes back their origin and, and, and kind of their diversification timeline. So while there's over 1,400 living species of bats currently all over the world, in Wyoming, there's this amazing fossil deposit from the early Eocene. They have uncovered over 30 bat fossils in the last 60 years, and they were all thought to represent the same two species. Uh, most of them were identified as Icaronicteris I- 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 index. And up about until about 20 years ago, uh, they were all that. And then 20 years ago, a second bat species was discovered. Now, this guy enters in. This this new species was collected by a private collector in 2017 and purchased by the aforementioned American Museum of Natural History. They're like, hey, interesting bat skeleton you got there. How much you want for it? (laughs) And so... This, along with a second fossil discovered in the same quarry in 1994, so they've been sitting on it a while, they looked very similar to each other and very different from the other species that they've identified in the past. So between that, they were able to identify that this was a whole new species. They gave this fossil a new name, Icaronicteris gunelli. Um, And so this means that they they're they're different enough that there's a diversification that they didn't anticipate so 
the long and short of it is oldest bat skeleton pushes him back a bit but really what pushes him back is the fact that these skeletons are so different from each other and also so different from other bat skeletons found around the world at that time so there were bats all over 50 something million years ago so if there's a common origin of bats we have to go further they are the most, I, I think this is right, they're the most diversified species on the planet. There's like... Well, not species. No? Mm-mm. They're like 1,500 different kinds of bat, and they're like represent, they represent like a crazy big portion of the, uh, at, at least uh, the vertebrate species. I don't know. So they're... Um... They're, it's a family. It's not a species. So species is the, is is a specific. Oh God! Type well, of uh, diverse, uh, diverse. Yes. So uh, it's a number family. It's Microchirotera, <laughs> the family of bats. Um, and so yes, they are very diverse. And so the question is, how long have they been so diverse? How did they get everywhere? How the heck are they related to whales? That's a whole other story. I don't know. Bats are was wild. it whales? I was the yeah. one I always heard was horses. Like of uh, no, if you're no. like they're are they're like more related to a horse than they are to a mouse. I think was the well they're they're most related to whales. So enjoy that. Most related to whales. <laughs> anyway, what? Um, so that was my quick bat story. Now I have oh, a wait a yes, second. And, yes, uh, so, and, but they and and whales uh, some kinds of whales uh, have echolocation. Yes. So is it is echolocation convergent no, no, or is I'm it sure that I think it's far convergent. way back? Hmm. Convergent. I don't know. Um. Anyway. Uh. So yeah, I don't know. Bats. They've been around a long time. We found a really old one in Wyoming. That's pretty much the whole story. I just thought it was really cool. Anyway, and it's also the only thing interesting in Wyoming. <laughs> so that's this two not things. True. Yellowstone is there, isn't it? Is that where that is? Yeah. There's Yellowstone, and then there's that area around it. Sure, it's, sure. It's got to put, um, you got to put it somewhere. You got to so put next, it somewhere where there's nothing else going on. Next, I have a, a fossil story from University of Oxford. This is something found in amber, and it is both a feather and some bits of bug. Now, this is why this is important. It's about a hundred and five mil, a hundred and five million years old. And based on the timeline, birds didn't show up until about 30 million years later. So, this is a dinosaur feather. Nice. And what this bug is, is a relative of dermestid beetles. Uh, Dermestid beetles or skin beetles are the ones that, if you ever go to a zoo or an aquarium or museum, and they have a bunch of beetles eating away at a dead thing to kind of clean off the bones. That's dermestid beetles. That's why they're called skin beetles. But there's a bunch of relatives to dermestid beetles that don't just eat flesh. They'll also eat decaying old feathers or hair. So they're, they're the custodians of the animal world. They are very, very, very important. Without them, it would be very gross. But so what they found were these larval molts in amber that are related to modern dermestid beetles. And so the idea is that they may have played an important role in digesting organic matter back then. And specifically, they may have had something to do with um, cleaning up fallen feathers from dinosaurs. In some other samples, they have found other feather portions, other remains, other tiny, minute coprolites, so little little poops. <laughs> and all of this is in intimate contact with the molts attributed to rested beetles. So they are doing the work even 105 million years ago. They're cleaning up. And so this is hard evidence that, f- that the fossil version of dermestid beetles almost certainly fed on the feathers that detached from these dinos as they fell. And so this looks like a co-evolution over at least a hundred million years with, with animals that 
um, that molt or shed and these dermestid beetles hang out. What we don't know is what kind of symbiotic relationship they might have had. Did the dinosaurs care that the beetles were around? Did they help them clean house? Its assumption is that they benefited because by eating dead stuff and old stuff, they are preventing disease. So whether that's kind of a an allowed existence or just a beneficial happenstance, I don't know, but they've <laughs> they've they've co-evolved with us and uh, and our relatives for for a long 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 time so we got those larval molts of the dermestid beetles in with some theropod feathers nice yeah nice do we know we don't know what kind of dinosaur it came from though no no, no we only know because of the timeline that oh, it wasn't when. a bird yeah yeah hmm. so it was it was a feathered thing so it could have been an what they call an avian dinosaur which that terminology is confusing to me but basically they mean uh one that flies or whether there's one that's just walking around that has feathers no an <laughs> avian know. dinosaur isn't one that flies is it uh an avian yeah. is is not i don't think is a flying dinosaur I think it's the the what they're calling the branch of dinosaurs that turned into birds, and it has mm. to do with uh, like hip and leg structures and stuff like this. Like they can mm. tell, like like I guess technically a, a T Rex would be an avian dinosaur. Uh, I think, even though it's you know didn't fly, but they would have had feathers at least when they were young. Uh, and apparently lips, which uh, the birds decided we didn't need. Right. <laughs> Somebody listened to the show. I was paying attention. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, what is it? Because it, was it the, 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 there was some signature in blood vessels that were being able to be found in the marrow of a t-rex bone that has led us to believe that the closest relative of a t-rex alive today is a chicken and an ostrich which makes some sense i guess so this is what's confusing though is that the the article says the feathers belong to an unknown theropod dinosaur, either avian or non-avian. But according to what I'm finding out about what an avian dinosaur is, a theropod is an avian dinosaur. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's unclear. Uh, as far as I can tell, they just know it's a feather from 105 yeah. million years ago. There you go. That's what yeah. we got. And, and it may be because it's 105 million years ago. Right? Because that's 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 also like... Kind of in the way back machine, even for dinosaurs, which actually really then yeah it's a pretty that's a pretty old uh it's a pretty old find to find a feather of even i think i don't know so a Maybe. according to the American Museum of Natural History, non avian dinosaurs are all dinosaurs that are not birds, yes, okay. <laughs> That's not very helpful. I don't know. It's send me your letters later. Yeah. It's oh. we know it's a an old feather and it had germested beetle bits. The beetle's on it the star of the story. We're the I don't know why we're talking story. about dinosaurs at all. They're just an accident in this in this. Uh, no, I, I think it's actually really interesting because the dinosaurs are incidental but important because. It shows that they have, like I said, they evolved alongside this lineage for millions of years. Mm -hmm. So it's an important relationship. Whether they realize it or not, it's beneficial to both. So there you go. And that's it for the Animal Corner this week. Justin, what do you have? Uh, I think it's time to do a station identification. And remind oh, sure. everybody that you are listening to This Week in Science. And if you would like to learn more about any of the stories you hear today, there are show notes and links on our website, www.twist.org, and we're podcasts wherever podcasts are found. So, 
This is this study that I'm going to talk about. Okay, first of all, I'm just going to do the, the study part of it. This was experiments at 48 different elder care facilities in China. And they found that st- giving the residents at the care facilities salt substitutes, as opposed to salted food, completely salted food, lowered di- diastolic blood pressure and resulted in fewer cardiovascular events over a two-year period in the study. This is a total of 1,612 subjects, uh, almost uh, entirely men, 1,200 men, uh, 1,230 men, 382 women. Subjects were sort of randomized, and they had meals containing either their regular salt, a salt substitute, or which was basically like uh, 62% salt and then potassium. Or uh, they had the a, a, a cut diet where they were giving them progressively less salt, where they just reduced the salt that they got. And, and so, yeah, and so they showed some good outcomes for these folks having... The salt substitute. Well, that's interesting. We know salt substitute. That's a thing you can do if you are, are you love that salty taste, and but you just don't want to to die of of a of a stroke. What well, I've never heard of a salt substitute. What's a what's an example of a salt substitute? So it's still salt, but uh, in this case, uh, <laughs> but it's less. It's it's cut with uh, a lot of uh, I think potassium. Oh, that's like you see low sodium salt, and you're like, what What are you? How is that possible? <laughs> right? Yeah. So you still get the the flavor from it, and you get a little extra potassium okay. in your diet. All right. Salt. So, uh, yeah. And in this, they say that the the restricted salt pl- supply was compared to the usual amount of salt and salt substitute. But that uh, re- this restricted salt supply showed no effect on systolic blood pressure. So, in a way, the study starts to hint at the idea that this salt substitute was actually better hmm. than just eliminating salt, which might mean, you know, because there's potassium in it, maybe that's Right, did they have a the potassium reason. deficiency? Yeah. Well, so part <laughs> of the thing is they also did this study... And in area of uh, areas of China, apparently, uh, that like their salt in their food. These uh, diets, the normal average intake was almost twice what the World Health Organization uh, suggests as a target. Uh, of, you know, the, the World Health Organization says people should have less than 2,000 milligrams of sodium per day. These were around 3,800 milligrams per day diets. So when reducing, trying to reduce in the restricted diets by 40%, the amount of salt they were taking, it's not like they were putting them into a danger zone by reducing the salt of these, these folks. They were still probably a little bit above what the World Health Organization suggested as the maximum. Okay, so... If I have all these results, part of the study, though, uh, they point out, didn't work. Okay. Despite <laughs> having reported some results, researchers found that they didn't get to actually do the salt reduction the way that they had planned. They planned on having a progressively reduced salt. So you take a little less salt every time you made a meal till it got down to 40%. For one of the group. But it didn't happen. Uh, they, they, and in the, in the, the paper, they're saying, well, maybe it's the study relied on the meal preparers and the facility managers to oversee this progressive reduction. And maybe the kitchen staff uh, didn't want to do it. Maybe they were, didn't like somebody telling them how to cook. Uh, additionally, they had a self-reported data from the subjects that said that they were that reported that they were able to detect the salt reduction. And so some added salt to their meals. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? So, and it also creates the possibility that meal prep staff who who maybe initially complied and reduced salt in the meals of the, these folks got a bunch of negative feedback. Oh, they were like, your food's in. terrible. Right, right. What are you doing? I'm not eating this. So, so but they don't know because they're saying, ah, there was noncompliance. People didn't go along with it. Uh, but they still have, I don't understand how they still include some results of comparisons in this study. But here's the other thing. So they were trying to progressively, according to this, reduce salt and attempted to reduce salt in meals without drawing notice. That's why they kind of did this progressive thing. They didn't want people to notice. So wait, so people opted into this study without knowing which group they were in? Is that the deal? Or they so, didn't know they were opting into the study? That's the question, right? Because, <laughs> because here's, here's the thing. This is exactly, I'm glad you caught it. If the participants were unaware that they were part of a salt reduction study or unwilling to participate within the parameters of a study, that could be an ethical question. Right. Because the minimum requirements for consent to be informed in human research is that the participant understands what research, what the research is and what it is that they are consenting to. Statements in the paper, this is quoting, that subjects were able to detect the reduction. It suggests at least to me that they may have been unaware that their food was part of an experiment in which they were included. So, but then here's the other thing. When, whether this uh, consent to be part of an experiment should extend to a cohort, cohort that is receiving an alteration in their diet that is otherwise recognized as healthy you know if okay if, so hold on we can we can give them the benefit of the doubt and say that people knew that there was a salt study going on okay let's just okay. let's just pretend that let's just mm -hmm. say that okay and that they just didn't know which group they were in mm -hmm. and if that's true then they still could have said this tastes gross give me more salt <laughs> and so the the i think this the problem with this is also, how do you stop them from snacking on salty foods in between prepared meals? Because that can also impact it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this study so a requires a, a non-blinded study. Like you need to know you're, you're signing up for a salt reduction so that you don't mess with the results. So that you sign up for the salt reduction. Right. Right. So then that's the question, isn't it then? Because uh, based on the universal, apparently, non-compliance by subjects, that to me suggests that they were unwilling right. to be part of that study it, or didn't know it was happening. Because, because of the fact that they're saying that they noticed and were just adding salt, as opposed to realizing, oh, I'm a part of this study. Yeah, this is for science. This is why we're doing it. Okay. So now also, this is, this is the age cohort. For some reason, it's the oldest that had the salt reduction. Median age of 72. May have fully consented. Been completely aware that they were part of this study. Uh, and maybe realized, oh, okay, if it was slightly blinded. And I, I can tell what group I'm in. I'm out. 72. I don't like the way my food tastes. Life's too short. Forget you. <laughs> it's possible that they just didn't want to comply, even though they had completely agreed to it at some point. Okay. Here's out of the paper. The it's source it's... material. Go ahead. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the from the paper in the notes of the how the safety or whatever ethical thing. The study was approved by the Peking University Institutional Review Board with a group of cons with a group consent obtained through discussions between the local study investigators, the administrator of each facility, and the government agencies responsible for the facilities. All subjects that did the baseline and follow-up surveys provided written informed consent. 
Now, the only part of that that I really have a problem with is the where, where they say that all of the subjects that did the baseline and follow-up surveys provided written informed consent. Uh-huh. Because not everybody got the baseline and the follow-up. There was a there's a some group we it's not really explained that didn't do the follow-up. Apparently, mostly uh, some of them were bedridden. Some of you know were just too ill apparently to have blood drawn. They also point out that it was a lot of women who were better educated who <laughs> refused to do the follow-up. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, but they don't explain like who these bedridden portion or people who were refusing to be part of the study, what cohort they were from. Doesn't explain. Like, were they all from one? Because then you have a signal, or was it just sort of random? Anyway, but the problem I have is if you only got informed consent from the people who did the, the initial baseline port participation and the resulting follow up, that sounds like you got your informed consent at the end. Yeah. The other problem I have with Which this is study... not how that works. Yeah. Ethically, the, that's not how you're supposed to do it. The other problem I have is that this is done on elder care facilities. Yeah. Which I feel like the grand majority of people, well, maybe not, but a lot of people in elder care facilities have comorbidities already. Oh, sure. So how is a short-term SALT study going to negate a chronic or lifetime illness that it just, it feels like right. you'd have to have a truly massive sample size yeah. to get around that. Unless you're looking at, okay, we changed their salt for, for 10 years. And this is what happened. These people lived longer because otherwise you're yeah. just noticing that, you know, a certain number of people died during the study and, and some of them, so <clears throat> had lower blood pressure and it's it feels like a little bit of a mess to me <laughs> it is especially because they, they they do the comparison to the salt restriction even though they they also acknowledge that that part of the study was a complete failure right the other funny because and it looks like they focused on people who died by heart attack or, or who had not died i'm sorry not died of heart attack but who had a, a cardiac event didn't they don't have to uh, have died from it and uh, was reduced and the blood pressure was reduced from the salt substitute what's interesting though is if you just look at the data that they present in that study there's an interesting chart that gets zero mention anywhere verbally in the paper which is there's this little graph that shows the mortality rate of the salt reduction group being higher mm -hmm. than regular salt. Right. So, so wait, the group that was <laughs> that was supposedly just having less salt, which still wouldn't have been like that low compared to what's considered a healthy salt amount in your diet. They had higher overall mortality. But let's not talk about that. We'll leave that. We won't discuss that in any way. I have all, so many problems with this study <laughs> that for something that was so simple of a seemingly so simple of a story about, yeah, uh, you know, reducing salt has these better health outcomes. There's a whole lot of like questions I still have about how this was done. And the ethical aspect yeah. of it, too. If you have people who are part of a study who don't know and are... The thing is, if, the, if you know you're part of a study and you've agreed to be part of a study, then why is there such a high level of noncompliance with it? Why right. is it out no, of that's the exactly hundreds what I was of thinking. people who were in that group? You couldn't go like, yeah. okay, we had 7% that just for whatever reason didn't comply so we removed them right but no it was widespread in that it's, cohort. whenever you do a diet-based study it's really hard to properly blind it mm. unless you are unless somebody consents up front and only eats pre-designed food 
that again would also have to be prepared by the same people across the board because that's the other piece here right you have the people who are salting their food because it doesn't taste good enough but then you have the people in the kitchen who are preparing it different at this one elder care facility than this other facility because they're like i'm not going to let them tell me what to do and the only way that this would have made sense is if you set people up for a meal plan that was delivered oh yeah to have control over that yes but, but the other yeah 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 you got it well and then you really honestly you got to take all these people these elderly folks and you got to put them into a lab you just got to raise them in a lab in a dish no the, <laughs> uh yeah oh gosh i forgot what the other thing i was gonna say but uh yeah there's a lot of a lot oh but yeah but why blind it why 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 and why yeah. this is not the kind of thing that you would need to blind for the participants. You blind it for the data outcome, right. which cohort yes, belonged to which. Yes, you blind the people who later. are analyzing the data. Yes, absolutely. You don't yes. blind the people who are part of the study. There's no mm. need to. You're doing a yeah. salt reduction in the meal study. There, there's unless unless you really believe that there's there's uh, <laughs> you're going to create a lower blood pressure. Uh, uh, psychological effect from knowing that you're part of the good state, which I guess, but I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I think what happened is they experimented on old people. And yeah, that is what kind of what it sounds like. It's yeah. But then, I it, think... oh, but then, but the, is that a bad experiment? Like, if the if the, <laughs> if the food services at all of these elder care facilities said, "Gosh, you notice that there's recommendations for much lower salt than we're giving people," and then just lowered it, that's not ethically right. uh, questionable right, in right. Any way. then you could it's actually that study using... statistics coming out of those areas if yes you're absolutely right there is a way to do this <laughs> <laughs> and it's not this it's not this right no. okay that's enough all right well uh tell me about a necropolis if you would Okay, so on the way to catch a train or maybe it was uh, getting off a train in Paris researchers found a 2000 year old necropolis What's a necropolis? It's a place where they put uh, dead people a long time ago. Uh, like a cemetery. Yeah, it's a cemetery. Yeah, okay, but an old it. one. Got it. Okay. Scientists uncovered 50 graves in an ancient cemetery <laughs> while ex- excavating ahead of a new addition to the Port Royal train station in the heart of the French capital, Paris. This was a, from a precursor to Paris. The, I'm going to mess it up. The Lutetia, Lutetia which was, uh, and, and it's nearly 9,000, or sorry, 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, there was a town there along the Rhine. This is, uh, they, had, they had some suggestions. There was a necropolis that was found sort of in that area that was previously excavated. This is a Gallo-Roman town. Lutetia, was previously partially excavated in the 1800s. So, however, the only objects considered uh, precious, only the objects that were considered precious, like they found some jewelry and some interesting, you know, maybe a little bit of gold or something, some some coins. Those are the only things taken from the graves. Many of the skeletons, the other burial offer- offerings, artifacts, that sort of thing, uh, were reburied because in the 1800s archaeology hadn't been invented yet. But grave robbing was a thing that you were totally allowed to do, apparently. So this is the Inwrap team. This is the a group of uh, what is it? The French National Institute of Preventative Archaeological Research. Inwrap discovered this section ahead of uh, that new for that new addition to the train station like they were like, we're going to dig out this area they said okay let's go take a look first because there had been some finds in the past let's just go make sure and they're finding 50 skeletons some of these have coins in the mouth uh they're they're buried with all sorts of jewelry and hairpins they have shoes either on or next to them these are people who were placed in coffins and 
And yeah, some of them have coins next to them. Some have the coin in the skull. Which was apparently, this is part of, this isn't an, an amazing because this is in, uh, in France, but this is how there was only a few mythologies, I guess, back in the old days. and everybody. This is called Sharon's Obel. Is what they're calling this? This is from Greek mythology. Sharon was the ferryman of Hades. Oh, so Chiron. Chiron. Chi is it Chiron? Mm -hmm. okay. I think so. Yeah. Uh, so and this was uh, considered like a bribe. Like, hey, this one's got some coin. Help it get across the river Styx, you know, ahead of all these, this riffraff that, that's dying in the same day. But yeah, pretty uh, pretty amazing to f have this big find. And also kind of interesting because, yeah, it, it reminds us that archaeology, the way that we consider it now where we collect all these artifacts and want to study them and don't just try to bury them, that went away in the 1800s everywhere but Florida, which is still practicing that today. There's a major development where they've found a bunch of artifacts recently in Florida. And Florida uh, wants to just cover it up again. Sure, <laughs> sure, With sure. the building. Might as well add that to the list of what's going on over there. Yeah, it's the least, of, <sighs> but it's still. But it's going to impact knowledge for of the world, of the past, of the everything. But, you know, uh, Florida will be underwater yeah. soon. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, well, that's cool. Well, plus the, the, I bet coins are very time specific, right? So that probably helps them identify yeah, an exact the, time, pretty the darn exact time. Coin that they found actually did uh, place the, I think the coin was second century. Uh, very cool. that they, uh, yeah, this was, would have been a time of Roman occupation. Of, gosh, the Romans were everywhere. The Romans had like, they, and that concrete that they had, we got to figure mm -hmm. out how to make that. Let's see, but really, you gotta then you gotta put the stuff in there and make it. Suck yeah, up suck up all the carbon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Justin, did we do a show? Are we done? Oh gosh, is that how that works? I think we may think have so. come to the end of another episode of this week in science. Amazing. Um, well, do you have any last comments before we close out the show? I feel like we need 10 minutes of filler, don't we? No, we don't need that. We, uh, ask me more about what's faster. Uh, give me a couple of animals. Yeah. What do you think <laughs> is faster? A clam or a mussel? <laughs> Wait, are they the same thing? No. <laughs> Wait, a clam is not a mussel? No. It isn't? No. What is it? They're different animals. I thought that's... Is it, are you? I know they're both, you're sure. They're both mollusks. They're different animals. To me, they're all the same thing. Okay, this is what I'm saying. I don't right. know what a mollusk no, is. I have no show's idea. Show's over. All right. I hope everyone enjoyed the show. <laughs> I learned today that Justin doesn't know that a clam and a mussel are different things. Um, thank you for listening, watching, chatting, etc. Shout out to Fada for his help with social media and show notes. Gord for making sure our chat room stays friendly and sociable and identity for, for recording the show, Rachel for your amazing assistance editing as always Kiki for being our fearless leader, even while she is away. And we'd like to thank our Patreon sponsors, which I will do by saying, thank you, Patreon sponsors insert list here. <laughs> Thank you to Teresa Smith, R James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazarb, George Chorus, John Radniswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard Chefstad, Hal Steider, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Don Mundus, Stephen Elberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, DVD Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hassenblow, Steve Leesman, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Ardiam, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Oldstabe, Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E. Oak, Adam Mishkon, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Codler, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Picararo, and Tony Steele. Thank you.
for all of your support on Patreon. And if you would like to become a Patreon sponsor, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. Um, on next week's show. Oh, we, uh, yeah, then I gotta say stuff. Uh, we will be back at 8 p.m. Pacific time on a Wednesday. And then we'll, we do a second show, uh, which is 5 a.m. Central European time on Thursday in the morning. So it's the same show. Uh, you know, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe while you dust your skeletons you are excavating from your nearby train station, just search for This Week in Science or her podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. You can also contact us or email email us or contact us directly via email. <laughs> <laughs> email direct contact us. Uh, you can contact Kiki and tell her, get back on the show at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. You can email Justin at twistminion at gmail.com. Or you can email me at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into an ancient feather in amber that will get gobbled up by a beetle. Uh-oh. You can also contact us indirectly on Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, three strong, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week.